Lord, we do pray for the one new man, the next yeah. hour that's coming forth, oh God. And we pray for an outpouring of your anointing, just as you pour, poured out your spirit upon us when we prayed just in, uh, this past yes. hour, Lord. Let it, let it, I pray for a momentum to build. To, to build, oh God, that, that they would, um, that there would be a higher, that the people would be taken higher. And, and, and I pray for a more, uh, a greater degree of understanding, a greater degree of wisdom, Lord, and what you are doing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Bless this next hour. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Audrey, thank you. Blessings to the previous hour. I, I just want to say, I am just um, for those of you not uh, familiar, you, you may want to, if you can, join us at 11 a.m. Eastern Time during the 10 days of all. This is going to go through till next Wednesday. And uh, we have invited many of you on this call um, to lead uh, an hour, lead and teach, lead, teach and uh, lead prayer for a, an hour in the Global Family Room uh, around the the reconnection and alignment message and i'm just say i just want to say how blessed i am you know this call uh just god's been using it for something special to prepare us as we gather each week and we glean and learn from each other the different pieces uh that each of us are carrying in this restoration message in the one you man it's just wonderful to see um, all of the different uh, teachers, watchmen, leaders, just beginning to to teach and communicate. And as I've always said, it's one thing to understand the next thing to embrace, but all together another one, when you start to teach and communicate the message, you have to have it deeper down, there's a Yiddish word, deep down in your kishkas. And uh, this is like your gut. And um, it's, I'm just so blessed to, to witness and just to experience with all of you leading those hours, what a blessing it will be. And uh, if, um, we will be posting, they're all recorded. We will be posting those recordings. They'll be up on the Romans 911 website in the next few weeks, along with the Pentecost Shavuot teachings uh, that we also did. Um, but I just wanna say that there is, before I introduce Eric, there's just such a need right now to begin to equip um, uh, many in the body to, uh, uh, to carry this message um, because um, uh, uh, the, the, the church is huge and uh, we, we may just be at the point and the spearhead of this message as forerunners, but the Lord is going to raise up many to begin to bring this message into into the church, and and we are as we move out of this shmita into the next season, um, this is going to become fundamental. We're moving into a new stage and a new era, and we're going to see the Holy Spirit unveil more and more and more eyes. Um, you know, using these different teachings uh, that, that many of us are bringing into the One You Man intersection, including Eric's teachings and, and, and Bob and Earl's teachings with Kingdom Calling. And um, it's just very exciting, very exciting. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cavelling. That's another Jewish word. <laughs> so um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our dear brother, Eric, Rabbi Eric Teitelman, who is going to lead us and guide us in the One You Man tonight. Blessings, brother. Thank you. Let me see if I can screen share. Nope. Can I get the uh, screen share option enabled? You should have it now, Eric. Yep. I want that river of living water over your head. <laughs> That's the banyas. <laughs> All right.
who is a Jew. <laughs> Let's see. Eric, you're breaking up a lot. I gotta send the zoom. Can you? Yeah, you might. Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you. You may need to turn off your video, Eric, and see if your voice comes through then and your and your slides. Can you you can hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Turn off the video. That's better. Yeah, it's, better? A better, it's a better picture of you too, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've frozen. Okay, so is it working? You can uh, see see the screen. Uh, no, no, now all we see is just the uh, the gallery of you and everybody else. Yeah, but you because you have to share screen. You got to share screen again. Okay, let me share it again. There we go. All right, can you you can see it now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now we have a picture of the Yankees playing Boston. <laughs> is it, I don't have a picture of the Yankees playing Boston, but <laughs> what do you see on the screen? <laughs> who is a Jew? Ah, Global Zoom, who is a Jew? House of David Ministries. You're official. Yeah. So. How, okay. Who is a Jew? All right. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. So Bob's in okay. rare form. Bob's in rare form tonight, Eric. Just <laughs> Bob's always in rare form. Okay. First mention of the Jews in the Bible is in the second book of Kings. And uh, it describes the fall and the captivity of Judah. So, of course, we know the story. Uh, the, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. The southern kingdom was primarily the tribe of Judah, of course, the temple, the Levites, and also the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin. And they were taken into captivity, into Babylonian captivity. And, of course, we know the story when they came back. Uh, that's the first time we see the term Jew, which derives from the word Judean, actually mentioned in Scripture. And so these were the descendants of the tribe of Judah that occupied this area around Jerusalem known as <clears throat> Judea, the kingdom of Judea. Now, Jesus, Yeshua, was called both the king of the Jews and the king of Israel. It's interesting that they they made that lay, that distinction that he was both the king of the Jews and the king of Israel. Uh, so there was obviously that separation that still was recognized between the northern tribes, which never returned from captivity, and the southern kingdom. <clears throat> and the apostle Paul referred to us, the Jewish people, as Hebrews, Israelites, Jews, and those of the circumcision. <clears throat> So most of the people that were most likely living in Israel during the time of Jesus were Judeans that had returned after the Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. Uh, I say that because uh, most of the northern tribes, there's no mention of their return after the Assyrian uh, captivity. <clears throat> and today in the world, uh, most of the Jewish people that we that know that they are Jewish are again likely descendants of the southern kingdom, and we commonly call ourselves Jews, uh, whether we practice Judaism or not. Uh, if you live in Israel, you and you have citizenship, you would be an, uh, an Israeli, not an Israelite, but an Israeli. And there, of course, not all uh, Israelis are are Jews. We know there are Christian Israelis, Arab Christians that are Muslim and Christian, uh, there are Druze and other uh, minority groups that live in Israel. So again, being an Israeli doesn't necessarily mean that you are Jewish. <clears throat> now for us, uh, some call ourselves Messianic Jews, uh, some call ourselves followers of Yeshua or Jesus, some refer to ourselves as Christians, Christian Jews, there are a whole bunch of terms but it's created a bit of a dichotomy, or I'm just going to say the, the natural descendants of Abraham. Simply, simply, we believe that Yeshua, Jesus, whatever name 
you call him is the Messiah of Israel and, and the whole world. And so the question is, are we called Jews? Are we called Hebrews? Are we called Israelites? Or maybe now we're just called Christians. But the bigger question here where I want to diverge, and this is where really where I want to go, is what about the Gentiles, those of the nations who now believe in Yeshua and have embraced Jesus as their Messiah, their Lord and their Savior? Have they now become Jews? And I've had people over the years, not many, that have come up to me and made some odd statements. For example, things like, well, Jesus was a Jew and I believe in Jesus, so doesn't that make us all Jews? And I've, you know, politely responded, no, um, it, it doesn't. Um, but, you know, trying not to offend people because usually folks that have that sort of a statement are trying to connect with the Jewish people and uh, especially trying to connect with Israel. And they're trying to find their identity connection. That's what we're really going to dig into tonight. So has all of humanity who believe in Jesus, Yeshua, now become this global community of Christians, a new people? Well, the answer is no. And of course, those who hold to this belief often hold to also what we call uh, supersessionism or replacement theology. I'm sure all of you have heard that before. And uh, they refer to these verses, for example, Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek. You've probably heard that term thrown around before, although it also says there's neither male nor female, and I don't think that Paul was implying that in the kingdom of God that men turn into women or binaries or whatever you want to call them. So I don't think that uh, he was talking about his ethnicity or our gender. I think what Paul was saying here is that we're all essentially equal. We're all one, meaning E-K-E, uh, equally in Jesus Christ. We are one. He also said here in Galatians, there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. And he's saying even uncircumcision avail doesn't avail. Well, circumcision doesn't really avail anything or uncircumcision doesn't avail anything. It's just faith walking through love. And some people have taken this verse to say, well, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you don't, you know, circumcision, that's irrelevant, and you don't, we don't need any of that. You just needed to have faith. All the Jewish customs, including circumcision, that's all done away with and so on. Um, in other words, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what you are. Be circumcised, uncircumcised, we're all just one big happy family, and uh, that's it. You just need to have faith and walk it out in love. And then, of course, the famous one, Revelation, I make all things new, implying that I did away with everything old, and everything old is pretty much just history. And you're not gonna remember the former things anyways, right? That's what the Bible says. Well, these are erroneous viewpoints um, that assume that somehow that God has done away with the Jewish people or the Israelites or the Hebrews, the natural seed of Abraham. And they've also diminished the fact that Israel or they've reduced or eliminated that Israel is a distinct people group within the larger ecclesia, the larger community of believers, believers in Christ. And so we want to make sure we don't put the walls back up. And so we're going to see how both Jew and Gentile are part of the kingdom. Who is a Jew, right? Now, Israel is mentioned thousands of times in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the New and uh, prophecies. Uh, so clearly, uh, it, God did not do away with Israel. And if he did, then he should have erased all of their mention in both the New Testament and the prophecies. But we know that's not true. And Paul said concerning the, the election, they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. And so this verse affirms, we know that it's affirmed in, of course, the Old Testament. But here, Paul, in the New Testament, is affirming that Israel is elected, meaning chosen by God. Now, to be chosen means that we are entrusted with a role, a task, a mission, uh, basically something bigger than ourselves as just an individual. And uh, in other words, it's not about us personally or individually as much as it is about us collectively. I mean, that is, that is the body of Christ, right? Uh, it also means that we have meaning and destiny, a greater purpose that is God-given rather than self-motivated. Again, it's about the collective plan of God 
and not our just our individual mission or purpose that we have set ourselves out on to be part of that we think we want to be part of here in acts for so the lord has commanded us i've set you as a light to the gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth and so uh while this verse speaks of uh christ jesus Paul actually used this, he actually quoted, uh, this is in the Old Testament, uh, Paul actually quoted this and he says that he and Barnabas were actually sent to be a, a light to the Gentiles, in other words, to bring the message of the gospel, the truth of the knowledge of the living God to the nations. And so to be a light to the, to the nations means to bring the gospel, to bring the truth of God's uh, kingdom and the message of the hope that we have in Christ and the resurrection that we have promised, all of that good news to bring that, that knowledge as a light to illuminate and dispel the darkness and deception that covers the nations. And this is ir Israel's irrevocable calling. I mean, Paul said that this calling that was given to Israel is irrevocable and without repentance. Israel as a nation was called to be a light to the nations. And so when God assigned Israel her purpose, Israel collectively as a nation became the fulfillment of that purpose in the form of a nation. So God had a purpose for Israel, that Israel would be his people. Uh, he promised uh, the, Jewish, the Jewish people, the Israelites, this area of land actually made the promise, of course, initially to Abraham and then reaffirmed it to Isaac and to Jacob, but um, it's part of the inheritance. It's not the whole earth, it's but one piece of real estate that God has promised to the Israelites. Now, once you are in, there's no way out. In other words, our Jewish identity, once imputed by the Lord, cannot be erased. So you'll, you'll meet Jews that are Christian. You'll meet Jews that are Buddhists, Boo Jews, as they call them. Jews that are atheists, Jews that are into New Age, Jews that are Muslim. You'll, you'll meet Jews that are into just about anything and everything, uh, but they are still Jews. And you cannot become an un-Jew by changing your our religion. It doesn't change, we can't, it's not a religion. I mean, it is, Judaism is a religion, but not to be confused with our identity uh, we can't erase our identity as much as an Italian can't erase their identity and you could pick any other nationality. You cannot erase your identity. You are what you are, but your religion can be Judaism, Christianity, and so on. But we're not talking about religion. You're talking about something quite a bit different, which I'm going to get to here. So the question is Jewishness, a tribal identity, an ethnic affiliation, or a religion? Now, remember, I said Judaism is a religion. Christianity is a religion. Of course, we believe that it's really about a relationship, and so it's not about really a religion per se, but it is, it is a religion. Uh, is it ethnic, or is it some kind of tribal identity? Well, God chose the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which might imply that there's a tribal identity or some kind of ethnic affiliation. And, and a lot of Jewish people, and if you talk to rabbis, and I just had a discussion several weeks ago with one our local rabbi here, he holds very, very firmly to uh, this belief, which is interesting because Jesus actually rebuked the leaders, saying, you think because you are the descendants of Abraham, that you are automatically given rights to enter the kingdom. And Jesus was rebuking them for having that kind of a false identity. And yet God specifically identified the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a unique family or tribe or ethnic group, whatever you want to call them, that were to receive the promise of the land uh, that Abraham was shown. It was a huge tract of land as far as the eye could see. But it's but being a Jew is is really much more than uh, you know ethnicity or tribal identity or affiliation. And also, it's interesting that God never precluded others from joining Him through Israel. Exodus twelve. You've probably read this verse many times. When the stranger dwells with you, 
and specifically here wants to keep the Passover. Now they would come under the law of Moses, so let their males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it, and he shall be as a native of the land. Now a native of the land implies the right to inherit the land from the tribe that he or she was joined to, and males were the ones that actually were uh, progenitors that received the inheritance, not to be, you know, uh, chauvinistic, but that's the way God set it up. But the males receive the inheritance, and if a male who is not of the descendants of Abraham joined himself to a tribe and came under the covenant, the old covenant, that was a requirement and circumcised his flesh, that was the sign of the covenant, he was given a right to the land. And this infers equality. If you owned a piece of land in Israel, even if you were uh, a, not a native born, you were a proselyte, a stranger, a gev in Hebrew, and you joined yourself to God's people, you became part of that tribe and you owned land and you were equal with every other person around you, whether they were naturally born into that tribe or not, you were equal. That's the way that God wrote the law. I don't think it actually worked in practice, but that's another story. So Jewishness is clearly much greater than tribal identity, ethnic affiliation, or religion. Really, it impri implies citizenship, and specifically citizenship in the kingdom of Israel, which is effectively the kingdom of God. Future tense. It's present. There's a present partial fulfillment, but the future full fulfillment is when, when Jesus returns and actually establishes his earthly kingdom, which we know will be headquartered in Jerusalem. <clears throat> And here he says in Luke 22, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is going to receive Israel as a kingdom. He's going to establish his kingdom. He said that, and actually he's going to receive all the nations, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance, that's in Psalm. And he's going to then bestow upon us what he has been given by our Heavenly Father. And so we, we are bestowed a kingdom as Jesus has been bestowed a kingdom from our Heavenly Father. So in a kingdom, the king makes you his subject and our identity is in the king and our relationship with him establishes our citizenship in the kingdom and so ponder that for a moment the king makes us his subject in this case we are royal subjects that's why first peter says we are a royal priesthood we wouldn't be a royal priesthood if jesus did not make us his subjects and so suddenly <clears throat> our identity is much deeper than oh i was born of uh, the tribe of abraham or i was born as an italian or i was born as a, a male or a female or free or a slave whatever suddenly our identity is established by the king who's made us his subject and the relationship that we have with our king is what establishes our citizenship in his kingdom so a kingdom has a king and a kingdom has subjects who are the ones who serve the king or report to the king or come under the king. So you need to have both. A king without a people is not a king and a people without a king are just dumbs. I'm sorry, that's the second part of kingdom. Remember, they're dumbs, meaning in this case, they're, not, they're, they're leaderless. Revelation three, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, I will make him a subject of my kingdom, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. It's exactly the same principle. I will make him a subject of my kingdom, a pillar in my temple. Now, citizenship in the kingdom of God, Jesus' kingdom, requires God's covenant. Remember, Israel had the, the old covenant. That's what established her, uh, not only the covenant with God, 
uh, itself, but also the the terms of the covenant. There were the Ten Commandments, and then you had all of the statutes and laws that came after that, 613 of them in total written statutes. But um, all, but the, and then they came, you know, this covenant came with blessings and curses. And so a lot of conditions, a lot of stipulations. That's why it wasn't a very good covenant. Plus, it only had a temporary covering for sin, and you all know that. So um, to be in the new Jerusalem, to be in the new kingdom or the Christ kingdom, the kingdom that is coming, soon coming, requires a new covenant. <clears throat> and so we are subjects of the new covenant, but it also requires God's chosenness. Now here, Paul says in Romans 9, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so Paul now is, is saying that God has expanded his covenant to include the nations, the Gentiles, and he has expanded his chosenness, that God is choosing out of the nations, not just uh, out of the nation of Israel, but he's choosing out of the nations also. And so Jewishness, using it as a, a model or a template, is inherited in the same way that citizenship in the kingdom of God is inherited. In Judaism, you have to be either born, in the case of what the rabbis teach, your mother has to be Jewish, but that's a sidebar discussion. But you have to either be born into the kingdom, your mother has to be Jewish, or or parent of the citizen, citizen of the kingdom. So like if you're born into Israel, for example, in the land, then you are part of, you know, the kingdom of Israel. And or if your mother is Jewish, then you are granted citizenship in the kingdom. But these are earthly principles, but they apply uh, to the kingdom of God. And that's why it says in Scripture, no, Jesus, Jesus said this, that no person can become a citizen of the kingdom unless they are first they become a child of God, meaning they have to be born again of the spirit and that's why john says here as many as have received unto them he gave the right to become children of god to those who believe in his name and so god's term for citizenship in his new kingdom that he's setting up requires each of us to be in christ born again of the spirit of god and so if we're so that's what makes us a citizen citizen in the kingdom we are born again of the spirit uh we were not born into the kingdom we were born outside of the kingdom so that earthly principle doesn't apply. So therefore, we have to be born of a parent who is of the kingdom. In this case, we are born of the Holy Spirit, who is the kingdom belongs to God. And so we were born of the Spirit. And therefore, now being born again, we are now children of God. And we are, as it says here, heirs to the kingdom. And heirs receive their inheritance through the citizenship in the kingdom. It's all tied together. So first, you're born again, you become an heir, an heir uh, it receives the kingdom, and the kingdom gives us our inheritance. And what is the inheritance? Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. So citizenship in the kingdom of God was promised to the Jewish people. Again, looking at Israel as the type of what God would do with the nations. And again, to inherit God's kingdom, the Jewish people are required to come under the lordship of their king, Yeshua. Jesus said, I didn't come except for the lost sheep of Israel. So God's purpose was to come. That Jesus, God would send his son, his only begotten. Jesus would come, God incarnate, God in the flesh would come, reveal himself first to the Jew and only to the Jewish people. They would be given the first right to receive Christ and therefore become born again, children of God, heirs of the kingdom and receive their inheritance, right? And of course, many rejected. And so then God sent his disciples out into the nations to begin expanding the doors of the kingdom, sending out into the highways and the byways, anyone that wants to come, the cripples, the lame, the whoever wants to come in, just go find them. I've got the table set, grab as many as you can and bring them into the kingdom. So the Jewish people are required to come under the lordship of their king, Yeshua as is anyone who else is invited into the kingdom. And refusing his lordship, and this is essentially what much of Israel has done, is the same as rejecting the promise of his citizenship. In other words, it's like you're saying, here's my passport into the kingdom of God, and I'm tearing it up. I'm not interested because I don't want, why? I don't want to serve the king. 
I mean, that's the bottom line. If you don't want to serve the king, your passport is useless. It's not a kingdom ruled by Eric Teitelman. It's a kingdom ruled by Jesus Christ himself, and he's the king. And if, if I tear up my passport, it's like I'm saying, I don't want Jesus as my king. Now, they're still Jews, God's elect or chosen, but they have refused to submit and have effectively renounced their citizenship. They've renounced it. You can, anybody can renounce their citizenship. You can go to the, you know, any consulate and say, I renounce it, tear up my passport, shred it, whatever, I'm done. And that's why Jesus said many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. They have renounced their citizenship. And Paul says, because of Israel's unbelief, not all, but, but many, some, many, some of the natural branches have been cut away, removed, and branches from the nations. The Gentiles have been grafted contrary to nature, meaning it wasn't quite natural, but God's brought them in and grafted them in the place of the branches that were dead that have been cut away. So now we're in this awkward stage where we have wild branches that don't know that if they're gra who they're grafted into and Jewish branches that are wearing yarmulkes and blowing shofars and Gentile branches that, you know, want to ignore their Jewish root. It goes on, you know, you get the gist. But being grafted into God's kingdom does require, does, I'm sorry, does not require the Gentiles to become Jewish. And, and that's the key there. So just because someone of the nations is grafted in, they don't become Jewish, but it does mean that they would be equally sharing and desiring of the things that are important to God. That's why Paul says that you are fellow heirs, partakers, sharers of the same promise that have been given to Israel, the Jewish people who are also now in Christ. So you are sharers of those promises. And what are those things? Well, include God's holy convocations, its festivals, Passover and the communion, the Sabbath, healing the sick, caring for widows and orphans, feeding the poor, sharing the gospel, making disciples of all nations, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, the salvation of the Jewish people, and the restoration of God's kingdom. That's it right there. You want, you want the Hebraic foundation of the gospel? It's right there. And this is right out of scripture. I've just taken the things that were instructed and given to us, the church, and it says these are the things that we are to continue to hold on to. So God's covenant and his chosenness with all who in Christ make us equal sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. Equal. Doesn't matter what nation you're from, male, female, Jew, non-Jew, we are, are equal and we are now all sharing in these covenant promises. And last point here, the Jewish people were not just called to be a nation, we were commanded to be a family. And that means we have a unique relationship and also a responsibility towards each other because we are a family. And, and Jesus set a very high standard for what that looks like. And he said, Great, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. The standard of God's family, Jesus' family, is that we would be willing to sacrifice our own lives for the sake of our brother or sister. Paul said to esteem others more highly than ourselves, meaning to think of others in a better light and, and give them more than you would even give yourself. Sacrificial love. That's what Paul even said. And so again, our Jewish identity isn't derived from our natural ancestry. It is to a degree, but it's really defined more by the spiritual heritage, which is in Christ. Remember, it's a new covenant. It's a new kingdom that is coveting, coming that comes with uh, its own new covenant conditions and a and citizenship in this kingdom uh, and, a, and a king <laughs> that is coming. And so uh, we have this shared identity in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, and not in our flesh. That's what makes us one. Of course, it's what also makes us born again of this, the kingdom of God is that we're born of the spirit of God and God becomes our parent, our father, father of all, right? And so our citizenship in the kingdom is with our brothers and sisters who have been circumcised in the heart by the spirit of adoption. And in closing here, Romans 12, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And that last line is really important. Individually members of one another. It shows you just how 
connected we are to each other in the body of Christ. Amen. I think I've stopped sharing now, right? Thank you. Beautiful teaching. Thank you. All right. Well, Grant, what's your pleasure? You want us to start praying into that or? Yeah, um, Eric, do you have three prayer points to lead us in, brother? Well, I didn't write any down, but I can think of at least three. <laughs> you want me to pray into several uh, prayer points? <laughs> yeah, and if you would, just to post a couple of others, and let's uh, let's just invite the Holy Spirit to lead us into into some yeah. around these points. Thanks, uh, Eric. Very clearly laid out um, outline for us. Hallelujah! You do always do this so beautifully, brother. Thank you. So, all right. Well, let's pray. If you're, not, if you're not following the King, you're dumb. That's what I got out of that that teaching. Right. Okay. If you if you don't have a king, if you as Jesus if Jesus is not your king, then you're just the dumb part of kingdom. Okay. Well, I feel pretty dumb right now. <laughs> you have, and you have the king. How could you feel dumb? You have oh. the mind of Christ. What oh, are you complaining okay. about? <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. I feel much better now. <laughs> um, Eric, um, you I know, have a quick question. Yeah. May I uh, ask no. a quick question? Yeah, go ahead, Priscilla, before we actually... Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And yes. so I've heard it said, and sometimes I pray, I said, well, okay, so Israel is the nation, is the land. So tell me about that. I don't, I don't even know how to phrase my question, but we're descendants of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob. So go ahead. Uh, what, and sorry, what is your question? I just unclear what. Uh, what you're well, asking. I'm not. I'm. I'm not understanding it. It's like he, his name was changed to Israel. Yeah. But we always refer to being sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm just wondering about that. Why? Uh, that's an interesting Israel. question. I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, I mean, I think that uh, I'm just. This is giving you just an opinion, so I can't say this is. Uh, you know, unequivocally true, but or equivocally true. But I, you know, we honor the patriarchs. Abraham was a patriarch, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. His name was changed to Israel, and um, but the name change was also the you know the implication there was that they were going to become this great nation. It was almost like his name change was. I mean, Abraham's name was changed also, if you recall, from Avram to Abraham exalted father to father of many nations and so his, his ironically we use his latter name not the former name abraham not not abram but the the way that i when i hear israel i don't think of one person i think collectively of these 12 tribes that came from jacob as a man an individual person and they became this big family with 12 tribes and you know many many people so um, I don't, again, I don't really have a clear answer for you. I don't think it's wrong to say Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. I mean, I don't think they would be wrong to say that since his name was actually changed by the Lord. But I, in a traditional sense, I, I don't hear that. Like you pointed out, I hear Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Israel kind of referring to the nation of the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel. Anybody else have a thought on that? Well, I think the, you know, the fact that Jacob overcame and he was renamed Israel, you know, but when it comes to, you know, reference, I, I, I like Eric, I, I, I use both. It depends who I'm, you know, it depends how I'm, I'm referring to it in conversation. Um, Shall we pray? You know, before we go into pray, Eric, you know, uh, you, you, you've raised a really good subject here. I think that why don't we give a few minutes to, to, to some questions okay. to see if anybody, you know, and we'll just go, you know, let's try and put aside 
uh, 10 minutes at the end to, to pray. Um, okay. any, any questions? You've got questions. Uh, Dr. Susan, are you raising your hand? No. Okay. Um, I do have a question, Grant. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm following up with what Priscilla was saying. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, well, we know that our Lord Jesus came through the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's a, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, uh, and uh, Israel was divided. And as a matter of fact, in my Bible study fellowship classes, we are studying about the divided kingdom. And how, um, I think you referenced that this morning, that um, there was a southern part of Israel, and then there was Judah. And I think Benjamin uh, made up the um, either the north or the south. Southern, southern two kingdom, separate right? Kingdoms. Yeah, two separate right. kingdoms. So our, our main concern would not be about whether or should it be about whether we're descendants of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or whether we're descendants of the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's, that's the point is that we all want to be descendants of Yeshua HaMashiach. We want to be children of God. And we can only be children of God to the extent that we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, our Christ, our Messiah, our King. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that <clears throat> really was the point that I was trying to bring the teaching to was that not to get quite so hung up on, you know, who's a Jew, you know, um, and really understanding that the term Jew is really only applied generally to the southern kingdom in many ways i mean it's it was you know three tribes that comprised the southern kingdom but um we're not looking as abraham we read about abraham was looking for a city built you know by men he was looking for a city built by by god and so we, that's what we are looking we are looking for a kingdom that is not yet it's here yet in us but it is not yet established in in the earth and so we are that's why we, you know, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus proclaimed, my kingdom is not of this world. And so um, that's the kingdom that we are waiting for in our citizenship that we have, both Jew and, and Greek or Jew and Gentile, uh, is, not a, is not determined by whether you wear a yarmulke or blow a shofar or a, wear a talit or keep kosher or that you happen to be circumcised in the flesh. Uh, or even born of one of the 12 tribes of Jacob, of Israel. What establishes our citizenship in the kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, is that we have received him as our king. We have been born again of the spirit of God. That's why it says we cry out, Abba, Father, uh, because we, we received the spirit of adoption. And now the terms of our citizenship are, di are driven by the king and his covenant, and, and we are heirs to the kingdom, and therefore we receive our inheritance through our citizenship in the kingdom of Christ. And so the, the church is much bigger than just uh, Israel, and it's much bigger than just the Jewish people. It's a huge expansion uh, for, and for God to possess and claim not just one nation, but all of the nations for his inheritance. You know, um, Yeshua said salvation comes from the Jews, and there's there's something else here. Obviously, to just to just to uh, add to to what Eric's saying, you know, Yeshua had to come first to the house of Israel, right? Um, he so the new covenant was re all of the covenants, including the new covenant, Jeremiah thirty one, were released to the Jewish people right? It says in John 17, now I'm going to pray for those that will believe in me through your message. So, so you know, he took, uh, uh, he put an end to, to the authority, the Levitical priesthood, and a Holy Spirit, 50 days after the resurrection, was sent on Shavuot at Pentecost and placed upon a new Israel, Jewish believers that established the church and took Yeshua's message out to the nations so that God's children from the nations could believe in Yeshua, become one with Israel, 
and also receive the covenants and promises that were given to Israel. So there's this beautiful one new, this connection that the Lord created that he's looking now to rekindle in us because it's a power equation to lead us in, in you know, into the fullness of, of uh, uh, what is about to happen as we come into the, the last great harvest and Israel's salvation. So there's this unique connection now that, that, that reunites the two that, that, that God is looking us to, to refocus on. And so, um, you know, but all of these covenants were given to Israel first and they took Yeshua out to the nations so that God's children could believe in him and become one Amen. with Israel to receive the covenants and promises. And that is the one new family that, that Jesus created at the cross in the resurrection. Yeah, that's, I want to pull your paper as well. Um, let us pray that the Israels will, the, the Jewish people will not be so proud about them being Israelites, but they'd be more proud that they accepted Yeshua. And uh, that, that's, that's what they should be more happy about because Jesus said, oh, Jerusalem, how I would have taken you in under my wing, but you would not. And I will not come back to you again until you say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. So that, uh, let's pray that they will have more more self-esteem and more uh, be more proud that he is that they accepted him as Yeshua than they are about about being part of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Let's pray that they would have more pride in in that fact. Amen. Amen. And then look at look at how the reality is. Look at how Paul describes the Jewish people that rejected Yeshua as broken off branches that need to be regrafted back in. And so secular Jews, liberal Jews, Orthodox Jews are all Jewish people that need to believe in Yeshua and cross over from the curse of the law that Yeshua paid for so that we would they would come into the new covenant along with us, those of us Jews and Gentiles that follow him. Yes, it'd be life, life from the dead. It said, if we come in and we're the, the, um, the wild branch grafted in, how much more would it be for them to come in to know who you sure is to be like life from the dead? Amen. Amen. Yeah, and it's it's really important for us to understand this thing, these things, so we know how to pray for the Jewish people. Amen. Any other questions for Eric? I want to read something to Eric and see if he agrees or disagrees with this. This was written by a Christian minister. And um, it says, when Messiah Jesus came, he came to the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. It's the spiritual and only kingdom of God of heaven. And it is of the Jews. Messiah is the son of David and will be crowned king on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. The Christian salvation is not some special dispensation of divine favor to the Gentiles. In fact, no Gentile can come under the new covenant until he or she, by being joined spiritually to Messiah Jesus, is a, becomes a member of the house of Israel. Uh, he cites uh, Hebrews 8.10. In fact, there's no such thing as a Gentile church or a Gentile kingdom or a Gentile bride. He gives the example of this. Upon marrying Joseph, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the Egyptian, became an Israelite. Asenath did not retain her identity as a Gentile. If she had, Manasseh and Ephraim would have not been considered half, or would have been considered half Israelite and half, um, half Egyptian. Therefore, there is no such thing as a Gentile bride nor a Gentile church. We lose our identity as Gentiles the moment we become part of Messiah Jesus. In fact, we become part of the only true seed of Abraham. There is neither Jew nor Gentile in Messiah, and he cites uh, Galatians 3.28. Does that ring true with you? I mean, there's uh, elements, obviously, of truth in that, because, you know, he is saying that, you know, once we come together as one big 
you know, family that we are the walls of separation, as Paul, you know, spoke in Ephesians, have been removed. Uh, not just separation, but the walls of hostility and separation have been removed, which is what separated Israel from the nations. Um, Israel is called a goyi, which translates from Hebrew and English as nation, and goyim is plural. And so Israel is not, so, so you have to, so the, the proper translation of the word Gentile, and I, it, it's, that's why you'll see I use it interchangeably with nations, is really simply nations. The question that we need to ask is when Jesus comes back, is there going to be one nation that covers the whole earth? Or will there be still nations that cover the earth? And the answer is in scripture, because in Zechariah it says, those who are left of the nations that came against Jerusalem, what will they do? They will come up to worship the king and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the nation, the Goyi, that does not come up, the rain will not fall. And so I think the confusion is Israel was one nation, but they were comprised of almost like a, a, a commonwealth of nations in a sense, that they were 12 tribes. Each tribe had their own identity. How unique? Each one received their own blessing that was completely different from the other tribe. How can a tribe be so unique at the same time still be part of this greater family called Israel? But if you look at Israel as a, as a type or a shadow of God's greater work in the earth of not just redeeming one nation for himself, but redeeming every nation for himself. And in Revelation, we see twice in both 5, 9 and chapters 5, 9 and 7, 9, I believe both those chapters say, standing before the throne, what does it say? Not one nation, but of every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And, and it even goes on to say that we sing a new song unto the Lamb, for you have redeemed us by your blood out of the earth and made us kings and priests. So I, I disagree with him in the sense that there will not be nations when Christ returns. I think that he is, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. I do think that there will be unique identities established for each nation, but the difference is that there won't be this wall of division between us. It, we won't be separated by borders and barbed wire and landmines. And it's like, it's like we will have this openness in the earth of every tongue and tribe. But I do think that there is an inheritance for God's people in the earth. And it's more than just the land of Canaan that was promised to Abraham. It's, it's much, much bigger than that. And where is that inheritance? It's, it's the nations, the whole of the nations. And if you get if we get confused, then on one sense, it's like people might think that Israel is going to suddenly take over all the nations and become bigger than the, the land promised to Abraham. Or we confuse and think that suddenly that being a Gentile or of the nation separate somehow separates us from the kingdom of God or from the household of God's family. And yet neither one of those is true. Amen. I hope does that answer your question? I hope. Yeah, it does, but I just have one quick follow-up. Then would you agree that when Paul talks about the commonwealth of Israel, that it's more like a picture of what England looked looked like after they lost their empire after World War II, and there was these there was this commonwealth or federation, right. if you will, and they had special travel privileges, special right. economic privilege, this is the sort of thing. And um, because when I saw the word Commonwealth, I thought, well, I think we have somewhat of a model in, in post-World War II, you know, England's Commonwealth. Right. Paul uses it only once in Scripture, and he's a little bit vague, but he just sort of throws it out there. And um, but if you, you know, if you look up the definition of, of a Commonwealth, it's a, sort of a company or group of nations that come together for a common purpose. And the promise given to Abraham wasn't just that he would make of him a great nation, but it says a nation, a great nation and a company of nations will come from you. And that to me is the commonwealth of Israel. And that it's Israel at the center of the kingdom, but then all these other nations that are symbiotically connected to Israel. And Israel is like the, the mothership, so to speak, the heart, the, the heartbeat of God's or Christ's earthly kingdom. 
but it doesn't diminish the fact that we have these other nations that are symbiotically, spiritually connected to Israel, grafted in amongst them is what Paul said. The cultivated olive tree is a, is a picture of that. So that to me, again, it's, it's like that there is this commonwealth of nations, but the, each nation also carries and shares a, a unique spiritual heritage and identity that is unique to the, that nation. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, we have a uh, could I ask uh, another a, question? Uh, Roxanne, I'm afraid we, we're out of time because we have to out keep time? Okay. to the email. Email me. Yeah. I'll put my email here in the chat room. I'll, say, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, that's great. Um, Eric, um, I'm, uh, I'm going to close this out in prayer. Um, okay. Since we didn't have much time to pray tonight, but it was uh, a very good subject. And I, and I also I, it, it, I felt it necessary for, for us to be able to dialogue with you around this subject. And as Eric mentioned, if you do have any further questions and you want to dialogue with him, you know, please, uh, please, please feel free to email him. Um, we have a couple of announcements. We're celebrating uh, Shabbat Shuvah tomorrow night. We're in the 10 days of all. There's a very special Shabbat um, called Shabbat Shuvah. Sh Sh Shuvah means return, and it's, it's, it's a beautiful time in the midst of 10 days, and the 10 days of all to return to the Lord. So we're, uh, we're doing this actually in the Global Family Prayer Room, but we're also doing it in the 10 day Zoom as well. Somehow, yeah. I think our IT people are going to link the two together. Um, and we're inviting everyone to bring candles and we are going to light the uh, light the Shabbat and experience the Shalom and uh, and go into a, a, a global Shabbat celebration tomorrow night virtually. Um, Next Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time, um, Messiah's House will be celebrating Yom Kippur in uh, the 10 days prayer virtual room. And uh, Karen Davis will be leading worship from Israel. Uh, Kevin Jessup and Greg Healy will be sharing uh, messages, brief messages on on the fear of the Lord returning to the church. So I wanna encourage you to join us on that. And then next week in the One Human Intersection and the Romans 911 webinar, we will be praying into the strategy. Beloved, I wanna ask you a question. I want you to write this question down and, and try and answer it. What is God's strategy to bring about his end time plans? It's, you know, it says in scripture, my people perish through lack of vision and God is calling us into deeper places of repentance, but we have to understand the type of repentance that God is calling his church into at this, in this day. And so we are going to, I'm kind of burning with this message right now. We're going to be praying into the strategy and then I'm going to be sharing with us and opening it up to our panelists. We'll have a panelist discussion on the strategy of the Lord uh, in particular that sort of comes out of the teachings of the Romans 911 project. So if you would, that's next Thursday. Ran, it's actually my birthday, hallelujah, October 6th. And um, for those of you uh, Watchmen intercessors, Global Family uh, Prayer Room is doing a special 12 hours of prayer on October 6th and October 7th. Uh, there are uh, 650 churches prayer walking the nation of India for the kingdom and the gospel to go forth. And um, uh, uh, we're going to commit uh, 12 hours of prayer in the Global Family Prayer Room in particular to support these prayer walkers in the nation of India to really begin to break down the walls. So that's some fantastic intercession. Um, that's going forth for the nation of India. So I'm excited about that. Um, let me just close in prayer and then we will, <clears throat> Bob and Terry with us tonight or, um, or Brian and Brian Shannon, and Shannon uh, standing in for that. Okay, great. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for our brother, Eric Teitelman. Thank you for his beautiful gift of teaching to lay things out for us um, that we can enter deeper dialogue and discussion 
to learn more deeply about these things in, in these days. Uh, we ask a blessing upon him and his family and the House of David Ministries. Uh, and Father, we just give you this time now and we pray a blessing on Brian and Shannon as they uh, lead us into the next hour in the Global Family Prayer Room. Hallelujah. Blessings, lots of love yeah. in Yeshua. And the, the teaching for everyone is I put the PDF file in the chat room so you can download, have all the notes and scriptures. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Eric.